Every crew gets to design uh, their own patch. Uh, in this next uh, scene here, you'll see our patch, which has the entire globe as well as the sun on it, symbolizing the global nature of looking at atmospheric research and the effect the sun has on the chemistry of our atmosphere. We had the opportunity to launch uh, midday on November 3rd, which made it a very comfortable wake up for half of our crew, uh, waking up at 7 o'clock in the morning. However, because we were a dual shift flight and conducted operations around the clock, the other three members of the crew had sleep shifted themselves to wake up to, uh, at 10 o'clock the pre previous evening. So they'd been awake about 12 hours, be, or actually 14 hours before we launched. We, uh, check the integrity of our suits, and then we uh, walk out of the ONC building at the Cape to get on the Astrovan for the seven-mile drive out to the pad. We had a beautiful morning for the launch. The skies were crystal clear, not a, not a cloud in sight. At T minus six seconds, the shuttle main engine start sequence began, and moments later, we're on our way. The 66th mission of the Space Shuttle program and the 13th mission of Space Shuttle Atlantis. We were already over 100 miles an hour as we cleared the tower and we began our roll maneuver to the attitude required for our 57 degree high inclination uh, orbit. Our trajectory actually took us up the eastern seaboard of the United States uh, just off the coast. At this time, the orbit, or at liftoff, the orbit weighed uh, around 4 million pounds and our thrust was around 7 million pounds, so the thrust to weight was pretty nice and uh, we were getting out of town in, in quite a hurry, as you can see. The orbiter was burning about 3,000 pounds of fuel per second, and as that weight decreased, uh, the acceleration increased up to about three Gs, or three times of Earth's gravity. At two minutes into the flight, we had expended all the energy out of the solid rocket boosters, so they were jettisoned to be picked up by the recovery ships waiting about 50 miles off the Kennedy coast. It's hard to imagine we sit on the pad and then uh, just a few moments later, later we were at orbital speed, just under 18,000 miles an hour, and we did all that in eight minutes and 42 seconds. So you can imagine the ride and the acceleration was quite unbelievable. Had main engine cutoff, we went from three Gs to almost zero G uh, instantaneously. It was quite a spectacular sensation. My first job was to film the external tank, which was flying in close uh, formation with us for post-flight analysis before it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. And one of the first things we do when we get to orbit is open the payload bay doors, and we do that for thermal reasons, but it's also a pretty exciting event for the crew because it gives us our first uh, real view of the Earth from space. The first day was very busy with activation of all the payloads, including the Krista Spa. You see Kurt and Joe in the forward flight deck uh, controlling the digital autopilot and also uh, keeping the big picture of all, on all the systems. While on the aft flight deck, uh, Ellen is flying the robot arm to grapple the crystal spa with a special electrical connector to activate the batteries. You see the arm uh, closing to the payload. Uh, you can see the target, uh, which is a very important visual cue for the arm operator to center the end effector and the snares around the grapple fixture. Then comes time for the deploy, and uh, starting with the unbirth of the payload uh, very smoothly to prevent any uh, uh, saturation of the gyros on board the crystal spa and then a maneuver from the low hover to the release attitude. You can see the mass antenna moving, uh, scanning the atmosphere. This is quite a long maneuver from the low hover to release attitude. Uh, Krista Spa is a composition of the platform Spa and the instrument Krista and Marcy. Krista stands for cryogenic infrared spectrometers and telescope for the atmosphere. And with the three telescopes on board and uh, very high speed sensors, it uh, collects a very high space resolution data of the middle atmosphere. And uh, when we get ready on the orbital side as well as on Krista for release, uh, I check uh, the trigger to open the snares uh, in order to start the release. And uh, you can see now the end effector uh, backing away from the payload. Very nice view of the Earth from the background. And uh, when the arm stops uh, at a few feet from the payload, the uh, Don from the aft flight deck will uh, fire the first separation maneuver. And uh, once the deploy is complete, the ground team and the crew on board is very happy with a successful deploy. Here's a view of the payload bay showing the atmospheric and solar science instruments. Uh, the main structure that you see is the space lab pallet with the six at atlas instruments on board, as well as a, a lot of the support equipment. 
This is a close-up of some of the solar instruments, and you see the door opening on Solcon, which measures the uh, amount of energy coming from the sun. And this is another view of the payload bay taken from the camera that's on the elbow joint of the robotic arm. Here's a view of SSBUV, an ozone measuring instrument, as the door opens and it begins to measure the backscattered ultraviolet light from the Earth, which will uh, allow it to measure ozone. This is the ESCAPE payload, a solar physics experiment sponsored by the University of Colorado, and it took advantage of four solar viewing periods throughout the flight. This is uh, the assembly of one of the biggest uh, secondary payloads in the mid-deck heat pipe performance experiment dedicated to testing uh, heat pipes extensively used on both automatic satellites to cool uh, electronics. Hélène is uh, currently running a spin test where pipes are uh, spinning to see how a centrifugal force uh, prevents the heat pipe to work properly. And we could set the power as well as the spin rate. We had also a PGAC to help collecting data. This is the protein crystal growth experiment. We had two on board, and we've been told that uh, we had uh, the highest yield of some of the highest quality protein crystals they've ever seen since uh, protein crystal growth experiments have flown on shuttle. And uh, the crystals will ultimately be used to determine their three-dimensional structure and uh, ultimately lead to uh, uh, better pharmaceutical uh, development. And this is a, a close-up of one of the uh, chambers showing some beautiful, very large protein crystals. Three gold boxes uh, that you'll see in the, the frame here on the locker doors were the accelerometers for the shuttle acceleration monitor system, SAMS, and we used uh, that equipment to document the microgravity environment on the orbiter. This is a piece of equipment called Albert that Jean-Francois and I used uh, to position ourselves when we were operating the robotic arm for the deploy and the retrieve. Our galley was the focal point of life on orbit. We hydrate um, some of our food with hot or cold water, as indicated on the package. Then we cut the package open and eat the food with a spoon. <coughs> Even after all those years of being told not to play with your food, when eating in space, it's almost too much fun to resist. Jean-Francois invented a new dish, shrimp cocktail on a tortilla. <laughs> I think building the uh, shrimp fajita was half the fun. Of course, eating it was pretty good, too. <laughs> we had plenty of cameras on board to document not only our in-cabin activities, but also the extensive Earth OBS potential we had on our 57-degree inclination flight. Uh, we took over 6,000 frames of film on our 11-day mission, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to see the world without boundaries, and also to get a better feel for meteorology, oceanography, and geology. This is a tremendous view of uh, plate tectonics in action. This is the Indian plate meeting Asia arising in the Himalaya range. And in the foreground, you can see the Ganges River here, several of its tributaries and alluvial fans that feed into the Ganges, and the foothills to the Himalaya range. And this is literally the roof of the world. There are several 8,000 meter peaks in this fr uh, field of view here, including Mount Everest and uh, Annapurna. Uh, just a gorgeous uh, sight that uh, the Blue Shift had a chance to see on several passes. Uh, up at the top of the, the field here is uh, Bowtie Lake, one of the landmarks that we use to identify Mount Everest as we go by. And now in the field is uh, the Tibetan Highland. It's a, a very arid land with a mean altitude of 14,000 feet above sea level. This is a beautiful scene of the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia. You can see the coral formations the uh, different color uh, water indicating different depths, several plankton blooms, and the uh, ocean currents in the sun plant to the right. We had the opportunity to see several major storms while we were on orbit. <clears throat> this one was Hurricane Florence that occurred early in our flight. We had, to, had the opportunity to pass by and uh, zoom in on the eye of the hurricane. You can see a very well-defined wall. We had the opportunity to exercise almost every day on orbit, and here you can see uh, Jean-Francois enjoying the exercise, the music, and the view. It was pretty spectacular <laughs> to do that. This is a view of the inner limb resistance device, uh, an exercise uh, device that I uh, developed when I was out at Ames with one of my uh, colleagues there. And it allows us to exercise all of our anti-gravity muscles while we're in space with minimal impact to the orbiter. In addition, it allows us to preserve some of our neuromuscular coordination when we return back home 
We can also reconfigure for upper body exercises. During our half day off, we had a chance to play with zero gravity. And perhaps my drill instructor from officer school would be impressed with this maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> Another big challenge during our little free time on orbit was with Scott and I trying to rendezvous two big bubbles of water together and uh, we, we managed to do that although it's very difficult to handle this uh, soft uh, big bubble in the mid deck. And even when you want to take a CD, you know it flies away like a frisbee. <laughs> this is me being attacked by the morning mail messages from Mission Control one day. <laughs> We are frequently asked how we sleep in space, and though on different ships, here the three rookies uh, are demonstrating the use of our sleep stations. We had a peculiar phenomena occur during one of our supply water dumps. We dump water overboard that's either not needed for cooling or consumption by the crew. <clears throat> you can see in the upper left corner here is the supply water dump nozzle with a stream of water coming out. What's building here is an icicle that formed on the uh, uh, outside of the cargo bay door, which is off the picture to the right. And uh, the icicle formed uh, and would have continued formation probably right up to the dump nozzle had we not stopped the dump at about this time. Now watch the plug here. <laughs> this is a look at the entire uh, icicle after it had formed about six feet long off the Palo Bay door. And that part of that ice remained all the way through the entry until post landing. It was still on the vehicle. Here we have the flight deck crew, uh, Don, myself, and Joe preparing to do a procedure called flight control checkout where we uh, crank up one of the auxiliary power units for hydraulics and we move all the flight controls and check all the implementation and displays out for our, our trip home, make sure Atlantis is ready to come home. Standard procedure we do every mission. And after uh, eight days of free flight, it was time to join back up with SPAS to bring it home. It is a beautiful sight here against the deep black of space. Kurt uh, monitored the rendezvous and performed the final burns from the left seat while I managed the various sensors used to display our approach on a port portable computer. Don flew the final stages uh, from the app station, taking inputs from us and the computer program, but ultimately using the best sensors we had on board, his uh, very own eyes. We worked our way in until we, had, we could see every detail of the surface of the crystal spas, finally for the grapple. Jean-Francois operated the, the handheld laser and gave Don and Kurt very accurate range and range rate measurements that allowed us to make our rendezvous time almost down to the second. Here's a little closer view of Christus Spas as Don is flying the final part of the approach. And uh, I'm getting ready to use the robotic arm to do the capture. And this is a view of the arm as it's coming in over the grapple pin. And uh, then I initiate the capture sequence, which pulls the payload uh, onto the arm and rigidizes it. Here's a view after we've captured it and before we've berthed it in the payload bay looking out the overhead windows. And the rendezvous was accomplished on uh, flight day 10. On uh, flight day 11, we went into our final solar viewing attitude, the last opportunity for the solar instruments to take measurements. And then flight day 12 was our day to come home. And this is us preparing to come home. And uh, one of the last things we do is close the payload bay door. Once we have the payload bay doors closed, it's time to reconfigure Atlantis for the uh, trip home. Uh, we get back in our orange pumpkin suits and uh, we prepare for the, the burn. We use our engines to slow the orbiter back down to re-enter the atmosphere. It's time to turn some of that kinetic energy we gained during launch back into heat. And Joe's pointing out the window, so Jean-Francois takes a look and you can see the plasma behind us as we uh, stream through the atmosphere, converting that energy back into heat. Out my right window here, you can see the glow around the orbiter also as we're pe penetrating the atmosphere. Don's managing, managing the energy, make sure we have good energy state. And here's a long range camera from Edwards picking up our yaw jet thrusters still firing to maintain attitude. This is a look out uh, Kurt's right window there as we make uh, about a 90 degree turn to final at Edwards. Um, as we uh, roll out on final, <clears throat> we had one uh, final test to perform before we landed. It was a subsonic aero test to uh, roll the vehicle left and right and to uh, yaw the vehicle left and right to look at control power in those control surfaces to see if uh, there's a potential for uh, more crosswind capability in the vehicle. Once that was complete, <clears throat> we rolled ourselves back out on final approach. 
We fly the approach now at about 300 knots equivalent airspeed. At 2,000 feet or so, we begin to uh, uh, decrease our glide angle from 20 degrees to just over one degree. At 300 feet, uh, Kurt extended the gear for us. And as we continually decelerate, we cross the threshold of the runway at about 225 knots, <coughs> 17 feet in the air, and targeting a touchdown speed of 195 knots. We uh, touch down about uh, 3,200 feet down the runway, and immediately after touchdown, we deploy a drag chute. We had the first uh, reusable drag chute of the space shuttle program. The drag chute helps us decelerate as well as lowers the slap down rates on the nose gear. Uh, the deceleration we get out of the drag chute uh, reduces the amount of runway we use by about 1,500 to 2,000 feet. Uh, at about 60 knots, we release the drag chute so we don't have to contend with that hardware post wheel stop. And uh, by this time, we had uh, flown uh, about 175 revolutions of the Earth, and uh, we'd been in space almost 11 days and flown four and a half million miles. And we badly needed a shower and a comb cooked meal. <laughs> No shuttle presentation would be complete without a, a shot of our launch. Uh, it's a very exciting beginning to the mission, and uh, this is a view from the base of Pad 39 Bravo uh, at basically sea level, uh, just a few seconds after your orbiter has lifted off. Again, we had a beautiful day that day, crystal clear blue skies. I don't think I've ever seen it any bluer, and it was quite an ascent. A few days later, however, we had another chance to look at Pad 39 Bravo from a, a different perspective, from about 165 miles directly overhead. And uh, you probably recognize uh, most of the things here in the slide. We have this pad right here is 39 Bravo where we left off, or did our lift off. And you can see the southern pad and also the crawler track where we uh, maneuvered the orbiter from the vertical assembly building and the orbiter processing facility here out to the pads. The shuttle landing facility is right in here as we see. And if you take a bigger view, you can see down here the uh, skid strip at Cape Canaveral uh, complex, and also the beginning of our space program, the very historic pads we have here for the Mercury and the Gemini program, along with some of our expendable pads that we use to launch the uh, expendable payloads, or expendable rockets, I should say, into orbit. Cape Canaveral uh, seaport is down here, and uh, if you come on fine, Cocoa Beach down to Patrick Air Force Base is here, on up through Cocoa and we have uh, Titusville Airport and Titusville up in here. So it's quite a view, again, very clear for Florida. And um, this is where we were supposed to land November 14th. Obviously, uh, Tropical Storm Gordon had, had other plans, so we, we wound up in, uh, in Edwards. Here's another view of our payload bay, and I wanted to point out uh, some of the instruments that we were carrying on board. We had three atmospheric instruments, two of them on the Atlas pallet, one of them here, Atmos, and then you can see the Mars antenna over here. And then up here on the starboard sill, the SSBUV instrument. All three of those instruments measure ozone, and one of the uh, exciting results was to compare the uh, ozone measurements between all three uh, instruments, which we were able to do in some of the northern hemisphere uh, measurements. Uh, Atmos and SSBUV were also, of course, focusing on the Antarctic ozone hole, which was present during our flight and was just beginning to recover. And uh, they were measuring the ozone within the hole at about half the level of the ozone outside the uh, Antarctic ozone hole. Atmos also measures about three dozen other trace molecules in the atmosphere to get a much more complete picture of how the ozone depletion process occurs. It measures chlorine, which is the primary catalyst for ozone depletion, and a lot of the reactive nitrogen species, which can bind with chlorine and prevent it from depleting ozone. And we were able to get uh, what the uh, concentrations of those chemicals were as a function of altitude, both within the hole and outside the hole. And they also found that chlorine exists in different reservoir species at different altitudes, which was a new and interesting result for the scientists. Uh, they also measure, Atmos also measured in the mid-latitudes uh, one of the Freons, Freon 22, at a value that had doubled over the uh, measurement that it uh, took in 1985. And we really still don't know the significance of what that might be. Uh, some of the solar science instruments, there's three uh, solar science instruments in the center of the pallet, ACR, Solcon, and Solspec. And there's one on the far side of the pallet that's hidden from view called SUSIM. Two of those measure the total amount of energy coming from the sun. And they were very pleased with their results. They were able to uh, get measurements with a precision of less than 0.05%. 
Uh, the other two measure the solar spectrum as a function of wavelength, and along with SSBUV, uh, three of the measure Three of them uh, independently measured the ultraviolet solar spectrum, which is a difficult measurement to make because ultraviolet light uh, affects the optics of the instruments. So uh, they were very pleased at that result. And the final instrument on board is way in the back, and you can just barely see the door open behind the Atmos. That's the escape instrument, and uh, it's a solar physics experiment looking at the sun in the extreme ultraviolet uh, wavelength region. This is our other primary payload you've seen in some of the other shots, the Krista Spa satellite. And uh, Krista is the main instrument that you see here, the big white cylinder, and it's cooled by cryogenic helium, which is what takes up a lot of that space there. Krista's primary objective is to understand more about weather in the stratosphere or the middle atmosphere. Of course, we're all familiar with weather in the troposphere, which is what we experience every day. But there are a lot of uh, phenomena that are very similar in the middle atmosphere, winds, turbulence, uh, large temperature changes, and not very much is known about that. And by measuring different chemicals that can act as tracers, they hope to understand quite a bit more about that as they go through their data. They're also producing the first global map of atomic oxygen in our atmosphere, which scientists think help cool the Earth. The other primary instrument, Marcy, is sitting right here under these uh, insulating blankets, and it was measuring hydroxyl and nitric oxide, which are two important chemicals in the ozone depletion process. We had, uh, as I mentioned, opportunity to see three different storms. One of them was a super cyclone uh, Zelda that was out in the Pacific. We also saw a tropical storm, uh, Gordon, develop uh, off the coast of the Yucatan, which eventually became a hurricane and uh, caused some uh, pretty heavy rains in Florida and, and severe damage. Uh, Gordon was also one of the reasons, obviously, that we did not land at the Kennedy Space Center because it was affecting the peninsula at that time. This is, again, uh, uh, Hurricane Florence, which developed uh, southeast of uh, Bermuda. It eventually moved north and became uh, extratropical and never reached landfall as a hurricane, but the moisture from this storm combined uh, with a storm over Europe and caused some fairly severe flooding over France and Spain. Uh, this is the uh, Indonesia, or part of the Indonesia chain, looking from the north to the south. <clears throat> the uh, large island here of uh, Java is present, as well as the uh, islands of uh, Bali here and Lombok. On uh, Bali and Lombok, there were some fairly severe eruptions of volcanoes in the summer of 1993. Uh, there are two uh, volcanoes on Java that are venting steam right now. One of them is... Uh, Arjuno, which is near the center of the screen, and it's difficult to see the venting that's occurring. Also over on the right side of the screen, which is difficult to see here, is uh, Maripai. Uh, Maripai, uh, three weeks after this photograph was taken, had a major eruption which caused some fairly deadly uh, mudslides to occur on the island of Java. This is the Ganges River Delta, the largest delta in the world. Uh, this photograph is centered on the country of Bangladesh, and what you can see it, here at the, the base is uh, massive amounts of uh, silt and clay sediment uh, originating from the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers uh, uh, far upstream. It's uh, an ecological uh, area of uh, key importance because all of this uh, uh, is mangrove uh, uh, habitat. It's an area where uh, many aquatic and land forms live, uh, notably in the remaining forested mangroves here at uh, the bottom of the, the view, uh, the Asian uh, tiger resides. Unfortunately, uh, other pressures have uh, caused a, a significant amount of deforestation and uh, movement towards uh, uh, converting mangroves into uh, rice paddies. And uh, so the shuttle photography helps uh, scientists document the rate of environmental change as well as geologic change, including uh, delta growth because of all the sediments coming from the, the rivers upstream. This is a, a gorgeous shot of uh, the highest mountain in the world. This is the summit of Mount Everest. It stands at uh, 8,848 meters, or uh, for those of you who aren't metric, it's uh, 29,000 feet and uh, change. It uh, is an area of uh, special significance for me because had I not been selected as an astronaut two years ago, I would have been on a climbing expedition and uh, probably, or hopefully, would have been standing on the summit as my STS-66 compatriots flew overhead. 
And this is a tremendous uh, synoptic view, a, a low oblique, of the region that we've just been talking about. Off in the distance here, you can see uh, the beginnings of the Ganges River Delta. You can see the foothills of uh, the Himalaya, the roof of the world, and uh, the Tibetan Plateau. In this view, you can see uh, Bowtie Lake, which we pointed out in our movie. You can also see the Everest region and the Annapurna region. You can see several tributaries and alluvial fans feeding the Ganges River. And this, uh, this view really demonstrates the rain shadow effect. And what I mean by that is uh, warm, uh, moist air emanating from the Indian Ocean meets the Himalaya. And as that air rises, it drops all of its moisture in the form of precipitation. And so we have uh, green lowlands and, and very snowy uh, high peaks, but very arid uh, territory over here. Well, one of the um, more nice places or the neat places to take photos from orbit is the Middle East because it's always clear, hardly ever a cloud in, in the sky. And what we're looking at here is the uh, Sinai Peninsula pretty much in the center of the frame with uh, Egypt and Africa to, to the uh, top and uh, the landform here that we see. We take uh, photos from orbit for many different reasons. Uh, a lot of them are taken just due to the sheer beauty. Um, however, we do take a lot to, uh, to study the Earth. Uh, geology is a major issue, meteorology, uh, how humans are affecting the uh, climate and how they're using the land. So to give you an example, this slide uh, has a lot of those issues in it. The uh, Dead Sea Fault right here, with the de Dead Sea sitting here is the uh, lowest place in the world, uh, over 300 meters below sea level. Everything flows in there pretty much. Nothing flows out, obviously, at that sea level. Uh, it represents the geology that we look for. Uh, it's a, we, from space, we can see the big picture of how uh, different plates of the uh, planet are moving around and tearing apart. And uh, we've been studying that in a lot of different areas of the world. Vegetation and how we use the land, the little vegetation streak you see right here separates Egypt to the uh, south from the Gaza Strip. And uh, also, if you look right in this area is the river uh, Nile Delta, where it is highly cultivated. And the ribbon of the Nile, which is very historic both in religion and history, as it flows or comes from uh, southern Africa there. Uh, again, we can study these areas using uh, color visual photos like this one or color infrared, which we'll see here in a few moments. And we can understand how the uh, inhabitants are using that land, whether they're overusing it or underusing it, how the irrigation and water system is working. Also, meteorology from this slide. If you look down in the, the left part here, you can see uh, basically streaks caused by high winds and sand dunes and uh, different materials moving around. Another example of this is uh, Western Africa over in here. We wind up seeing a lot of sand and uh, material blowing off the, uh, the Western deserts of Africa. Uh, and the same systems that bring us the hurricanes uh, across the Atlantic to uh, Central America and to the United States area. Uh, we have documented results that show material uh, maybe off your car in the mornings uh, of sand and dust that have really come from the African continent and is just being carried in the upper level winds halfway around the world. Another photo here showing the effects of uh, humans on the environment. This is the Okavanga River Delta in uh, northern Botswana, which is in the southern tip of Africa. Uh, it's an inland delta. It's kind of unique in that the river flows into this delta. Usually we think of deltas being into the ocean, like New Orleans, but uh, this is an inland delta. Heavy rains and uh, wetlands uh, in northern Ang or in Angola flow down the river and enter the delta at this point, and due to a bunch of faults and rifts, again, geology-wise, causes the river to dam up and, perform, and pro uh, form this inland delta. The uh, size of the delta is kind of unbelievable from here to the tip of it down here where it enters the Kalahari Desert is about 90 mi 95 miles long and it takes over six months from the water to move from this area to maybe the tip of the delta. During that time it's absorbed, used by the plant life uh, or evaporated and uh, some of the civilizations around there are trying to pump water out of this area to mining operations into cities, again which will destroy this um, area which is very similar to the South American rainforest. It is one of the more wilder region, regions of the African continent. Uh, huge herds of buffalo, elephant, and uh, zebras, and other animals uh, roam there quite often. We photograph this area almost every shuttle flight, if we can, to help document the changes in this delta, because it's kind of a, a miniature 
uh, model of how other areas of the world are working. Uh, a lot of times in these areas up here, we see uh, forests or see fires where people are burning off the, uh, the wetlands so they can use the, um, the area for grazing since cattle herding and uh, uh, cattle is the, uh, the biggest in the industry for the local population. And over the past hundred years, we've, uh, we've documented the changes in this river delta, how uh, different uh, weather phenomena and uh, how humans are affecting it, and uh, it's slowly shrinking and uh, going away. This is an oblique view of uh, Lake Chad. Uh, Lake Chad is uh, located at the border of uh, Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and uh, Cameroon. It's uh, also a very good subject for photography on each shot of sites as uh, it is a very shallow lake, less than uh, 25 feet deep, and uh, that's why the size varies uh, seasonally very much. The picture shows the water on the southern uh, basin. The picture is looking uh, south. So you have the water on the south basin, and uh, you can see also very big uh, dunes uh, covering the eastern and the northern edges of the lake where uh, water used to stand before. And uh, also can be seen uh, the prevailing uh, wind direction very easily with the agricultural uh, burning uh, blowing to the west. This uh, near vertical cross color infrared picture shows a very unique agricultural pattern uh, south of Khartoum between the white and the blue Nile rivers. Uh, of course, it's infrared, that's why uh, everything green uh, looks red on the picture. Uh, uh, hundreds of uh, rectangular fields can be seen uh, over a size of about 100 miles, and also straight lines that are the water field canals irrigating this uh, region. This is uh, by very far the biggest uh, irrigation project in North Africa. Uh, in a periodic cycle uh, throughout the year, half of the fields are in crop essentially of cotton, and the other half is uh, fallow for resting soil and also for test and so on. This is also an <coughs> oblique view uh, of the Strait of uh, Gibraltar looking uh, southeast. Uh, Mediterranean Sea is on the upper left corner, and you have the Atlantic Ocean on the right. This is Africa on the top and uh, Spain on the left. The sand glint uh, highlights very much the high currents uh, through the strait and also uh, current shears uh, along these uh, straight lines, starting from the uh, coast of Spain. Uh, also, we can see uh, uh, very easily uh, surface water patterns thanks to the, the glint and also some uh, very small uh, sheep waste. The sand glint uh, highlights also the town of Tanger here in uh, Morocco, Africa, and also uh, the Bay of Cadiz uh, in Spain. Uh, also, uh, you can see very long uh, contrails on the bottom of the picture. This is a nice uh, oblique view looking uh, northeast uh, of uh, the whole uh, Alp uh, mountain chain, uh, which is a natural border of uh, binding the some of the main European Space Agency countries participating in the International Space Station program, France on the left, Italy on the right, Germany on the upper right corner, and Switzerland in the middle. Uh, can be seen uh, very easily the pattern of the Rhone Valley with the famous uh, curve, the inverted L shape, and the 90 degrees angle here leading to the Geneva Lake, and also uh, it's very easy to see these uh, big valleys here on the it Italian side as they have been uh, shaped as a U letter by uh, glaciers during the last uh, ice age. This is the Aosta Valley and this is the valley leading to Turin. <coughs> and here you see uh, the Isère and Morienne where a lot of very famous uh, French uh, and uh, Italian skiing resorts are located. This is a view of Greenland. And because of the time of day that we launched, uh, we had sunrises usually in the very southern part of our orbit, and then we had sunlit uh, as we ascended in our orbit and uh, had sunsets at the top of our orbit. So this is kind of a late afternoon shot. And of course, it's easy to pick out uh, all the fjords along the coastline, which were created uh, during the last great ice age about 10,000 years ago. And it's interesting to find out that the ice, particularly in the center of Greenland, is about 10,000 feet thick that there are still rivers of ice that are flowing towards the ocean uh, where the ice then either melts or form, uh, forms icebergs. 
This is a view of volcanic terrain in the uh, central Andes in South America. And uh, I like this view because it's very exotic looking. And if you didn't know you were looking at the Earth, you might think that you were exploring another planet. The geologists are interested in pictures like this, not only because of the uh, many different types of volcanic uh, landforms that they can pick out in the picture, but also because there are a lot of uh, dry lake beds and they can pick out ancient shorelines and some of the alluvial sands. And they can also chart uh, changing water levels in some of the lakes. And there's a very small uh, uh, turquoise lake, if you can see it up here in the upper right. This uh, near uh, vertical photograph of deforestation in Brazil uh, was one of our Earth Ob targets that we were asked to study and shows two distinctly different agricultural land use patterns in terms of their maturity. The larger rectangular uh, shapes down on the, on the bottom of the, of the view uh, represent uh, an older and more uh, fully developed agricultural environment, while the smaller, uh, less developed areas uh, are more recent agricultural development. This scene is fairly typical of the landscape in, uh, in southwestern Brazil, by the way. Uh, photographs such as these are, are uh, excellent tools to illustrate the areas of change that are occurring in uh, some more remote areas of our world. Uh, they provide the scientists with uh, insight into the rate at which the tropical uh, rainforest and the transition zones of the tropical rainforest are uh, being altered and in some uh, cases are shown here in a very dramatic way. This is a, uh, a photograph that uh, shows the southern part of the Eleuthera Island in the northern Bahamas. Looks like a nice place to visit. As a matter of fact, if you look again in about 20 years, you may see me on a sailboat down there someplace. <laughs> Uh, the hook-shaped island encloses a relatively shallow platform uh, as evidenced by the lighter blue color, which is surrounded by the, the dark blue, uh, much deeper water. The feathery pattern in the center here um, is a um, uh, platform of sandbars and, and sand channels created by the tidal currents that are moving in and out uh, and off of, of the platform. The channels uh, serve as a, a funnel uh, to uh, move large amounts of, of the limestone off of the platform and down into the deeper water. This, of course, is, uh, is a fantastic view of, of the Grand Canyon created by the Colorado River that, that starts uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado and then uh, works its way down into, into Lake Powell right here, uh, created by the Glen Canyon Dam there, and then cuts the, the Grand Canyon 227 miles long in total, most of it you, that you can see in this view, and uh, averages about 10 miles wide and a mile deep. Now, if you've ever visited the, the Grand Canyon, you probably stood at the village uh, uh, on the rim right there and, and marveled at how magnificent the site was, looked across to the, to the north rim that is in the Kaibab Plateau that is covered by snow here, and uh, it's just it's equally a marvelous sight from space. The Mount Espina Glacier in, in uh, southern Alaska is a classic example of a, of a Piedmont uh, glacier lying along the foot of a mountain and then flowing into the sea. The principal source of ice for this glacier is provided by the, the Seward Ice Field that is up in the, the northern area here, and then the ice flows in to the glacier through these three, ch three channels. The uh, uh, glacier moves and surges and that moves the earlier form of the moraines outward and in expanding uh, concentric circles and it creates these, these patterns that you see here as it moves into the ocean. Going to the uh, other end of the globe <coughs> from uh, north to south, we're down here near Antarctica. This is Heard Island, which is down near uh, Antarctica. And the, the uh, special part of this picture is the uh, wind patterns that you can see in the clouds here. <coughs> as the uh, wind flows past the island, it creates these vortices called von Karman vortices. <coughs> As the vortices develop, you can see how the cloud patterns develop and dissipate, causing these uh, opposing uh, vortices in the wind patterns. So not only do we see the wind patterns, but we also see the cloud formations develop there as well. We were very fortunate to have several uh, crystal clear passes over Japan, and this is the southern end of the island of Kyushu in Japan. And uh, up near the top of the frame, you can see the volcanic, volcano uh, Sakurajima with a little bit of steam plume uh, emanating from the top. You can also see uh, quite a bit of ash collection uh, near the summit. And uh, also what's striking uh, 
on every pass over Japan is the population density. And I think you can appreciate in this uh, view uh, several areas of uh, 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 population density, uh, several large cities, including just to the west of Sakurajima, uh, a town called Kagoshima. And it's interesting that uh, the school children there have grown so accustomed to uh, volcanic activity that uh, they often wear hard hats to school. This is our last picture in our series of slides. This uh, clearly is a mission that was dedicated to looking at the health of our planet, and if there's anything uh, that the entire population of the planet's interested in, it's the health of our homes. 